Okay, so good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the first in the series of the quantitative seminar, online seminar for Institute of Oceans and Fisheries. And uh, this is going to be a weekly seminar, although uh, I can line up people starting about three weeks from now every week, uh, but I haven't got anybody for the next two weeks, so I'll still try. Um, and uh, so I'm Murdoch McAllister. I'm, uh, I'm a social professor in oceans and fisheries, and uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I've been appointed by Carl to organize this webinar. And uh, I think I can hear somebody talking in the background, so uh, could, could people please uh, mute, uh, not speaking? Um, yeah, thanks. And uh, I've been also prompted to give the land acknowledgement. Um, so uh, it goes like this. We would like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. So that's it. And so we, today we can I now turn to uh, Carl Walters, uh, Professor Emeritus, uh, who's giving today's seminar. Carl uh, uh, was a professor at DBC from approximately 1970 to about around 2010. So he was a professor um, in fisheries and analysis, uh, dynamics modeling and uh, contributing uh, for 40 years. Uh, you can see with a lot of the focus of his research uh, being on what's happening in BC uh, fisheries, um, and fisheries ecosystems. He's contributed hugely to understanding uh, about what's going on and uh, how to, uh, let's say, model, model uh, what's going on and, uh, let's say, analyze data uh, for all these years. And he's been a emeritus professor for the last 10 years and he's still going strong. Uh, he's contributing still and uh, he's, he's still on a lot of graduate committees, um, still really active. Uh, so it's just fantastic to have uh, Carl's uh, contributing among us. And uh, so uh, uh, with that, uh, I think I'll turn it over to Carl and we look forward to Carl's talk. Thanks. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna uh, talk about a series of uh, fish population collapses in BC that have been extremely puzzling. Uh, fish, just as a preface to this talk, uh, fish stock collapses, collapses have occurred in a lot of places. And some researchers have urged you to believe that the main cause of these collapses have been overfishing. Uh, this assertion is false in general and certainly for BC. Uh, recent BC fish stocks collapses that I'm going to talk about in herring, salmon, sockeye stocks, uh, all involved situations where management was very conservative and where there was a basic change in productivity that caused the collapse, not, not overfishing. Uh, just as a, a general point, uh, Billy Christensen and others have looked at patterns of surplus production uh, versus population size for a large number of fish stocks around the world. And what we find is that in almost in about 40% of the cases where there have been collapses, those collapses occurred while stock size was high. Uh, in other words, the collapses were not caused by fishing. Uh, so this is a theme that is important for understanding how to interpret long-term data on things like catches, is that we should not be assuming beforehand that if you see a collapse that it was probably due to overfishing. Okay, now uh, I became suspicious about the possible role of uh, pinniped predation in, uh, in causing BC stock collapses after uh, Peter Alicia published two dramatic papers uh, where he reconstructed historical abundances of uh, harbor seals and stellar sea lions over, over almost a century and over, over a century in British Columbia. One uh, key finding that Alicia made is that uh, seal abundances at least were probably only about half as high in, 19, in, in the 1880s as they are today. As of the 1880s and earlier, uh, there was extensive First Nations harvesting of seals and sea lions that probably kept their abundance as well below what we see out there today. 
uh, just a scary statistic is that stellar sea lions are now consuming uh, about 300,000 tons of fish a year, which is more than the combined tonnage of all of the fisheries uh, of British Columbia and of aquaculture in British Columbia. So there's a definitely cause for concern about the impact of, uh, of uh, this consumption. And we think it shows up, as I'll be saying, in our commercial catches of fish of various kinds. Uh, we've tried to assess pinniped impacts on uh, fish stocks using two main methods. One of them is just statistically comparing uh, direct mortality rate measurements on fish with changes in pinniped abundance. We're just asking basically have increases in mortality rate that we've seen during these collapses been correlated with space-time changes in mortality rates. And then also we've done a direct calculation of possible predation rates using prey abundance estimates and estimates of how much pinnipeds, how many pinnipeds there are and how much they eat. Just asking, uh, could these animals possibly be eating enough to account for measured changes in mortality rates? You know, if there aren't enough of them or if they don't eat enough, we could reject any hypothesis that they were having an important effect. Unfortunately, we cannot. Uh, just as a word of caution here, there's at least three things can go wrong with these methods. Uh, all of the mortality changes that we've observed are also correlated with other factors that have exhibited long-term changes like water temperatures. Just to remind you, correlation does not imply causality. Uh, we cannot be sure that the fish eaten by pinnipeds would not have died anyway. It's possible that factors like disease are setting fish up to die and making them more vulnerable to pinnipeds and that the animals would have, the fish would have just died anyway. Mortality may be non-additive. But on the other side, we also know that predators can kill prey without eating them. They can cause mortality rates higher than expected from how much they eat by causing prey to exhibit risk-sensitive foraging behaviors that reduce growth and survival rates. So let me first talk about uh, the BC herring fishery. This is one of the most interesting stories here. The BC herring fishery started back uh, in the early 1900s. It built up steadily until 1969 when a reduction fishery that targeted juvenile herring caused a catastrophic overfishing and collapse. The fishery was shut down and then it was rebuilt as a row fishery. And when this summary graph was produced by Al Hurston in 1980, things were looking pretty rosy. The stock seems to have been, uh, the, stock, the overall stock coastwide seemed to have recovered. But then uh, when we look on a stock by stock basis, there's five major stocks uh, of herring along the coast uh, in BC. Uh, since 1990, we've seen pretty dramatic collapses in three of the areas uh, around Haida Gwaii, in the central coast and on the west coast of Vancouver Island where the Georgia Strait stock has remained high and the Prince Rupert stock also. Uh, we have lots of data on age composition and spawning stock abundances and things. And uh, from that, we can calculate directly how much mortality rates have changed. And in the stocks that exhibited severe declines like Ida Gwaii, there was a huge increase in natural mortality rates coincident with the stock collapses. These areas where the stocks have collapsed uh, have been shut to close down to fishing for uh, up to 20 years without any clear signs of stock recovery. Uh, the changes in natural mortality rates are really obvious when you look at uh, DFO's time plots showing uh, the proportions of fish uh, in their samples that are of different ages. In areas like Haida Gwaii, the average age of the fish caught in the fishery has dropped dramatically and has remained low after complete fishery closure. Same thing on the west coast of Vancouver Island. In the, in the Georgia Strait, there's been no such decline, decline in either abundance 
or in the uh, average age of fish or in Prince Rupert. The central coast is in between the two extremes. When we uh, take the direct natural mortality rate estimates that have, you can measure from the age composition data and compare them to uh, the predicted predation mortality rates calculated from sea lion abundances uh, measured in the areas uh, where uh, herring congregate to spawn, we find a very strong positive correlation between uh, mortality rates predicted uh, due to pinniped consumption and uh, observed mortality rates. I should say here that herring, like many small pelagics, show strong seasonal spawning aggregation. And it's very well known that marine mammals, particularly stellar sea lions, follow the herring to the spawning areas and aggregate in those spawning areas and uh, can consume large numbers of, uh, of juvenile herring uh, very easily without even having to search for the herring. Uh, okay, so that's the basic herring story. And if you want to look at the kind of details that I've just shown you, the uh, slideshow uh, that I'm pre the presentation here uh, will be available through Murdoch McAllister. So you can go back and read through these charts that I don't have to go time enough to go through with you. Okay, so there's an instance where we have direct mortality rate estimates from uh, size age composition data, direct natural mortality and fishing rate estimates. And we've seen increases in mortality rates that are very well correlated with relative abundances of marine mammals in the different herring areas and over time. Uh, there's been a long history of sustainable salmon harvesting in British Columbia from the, with good data going back to the 1920s and a major decline in the harvests of all salmon species uh, during the 1990s. Those uh, declines were accompanied with a radical reduction in the proportion of fish actually harvested each year in the exploitation rate. So the decline in catches is more severe than the decline in abundances because the catch is the product of abundance times exploitation rates. So you get lower catches because the harvest rates were reduced as well as lower abundances of some stocks. Uh, when we look at coastwide Chinook and coho salmon, this is the same picture I showed you earlier. Uh, the Chinook and coho fisheries build up in the early 1900s coincident with uh, control programs that reduced sea seal and sea lion abundances dramatically. Then we had a long period where we had high productivity and low seal, uh, seal uh, and sea lion abundances. And then as the marine mammal populations build up after uh, uh, protection in 1970, we saw first a gradual and then dramatic decline in commercial catches of Chinook and coho. A lot of these Chinook and coho fisheries are now closed uh, and we have not seen recoveries in the stocks uh, following the closure. We also know that juvenile abundances of Chinook and coho entering the ocean have not decreased over this time period. It's, so you can't claim that abundance declines were due to overfishing because they're still producing the same number of juveniles. Also, very high proportions of the juveniles are actually produced in hatcheries for which there is no overfishing issue and the hatchery stocks are seeing the same declines uh, as, the, uh, as the wild populations. And that decline is in the first ocean year survival rate. So uh, more closer to home in the Georgia Strait out here, the Georgia Strait supported one of British Columbia's most valuable fisheries. When we look back in the 1970s and 1980s, the uh, recreational fishery had fishing efforts, 800,000 fishing days a year, generating huge economic revenues uh, to businesses around the Georgia Strait. As uh, seal abundances build up in the Georgia Strait, that fishery collapsed progressively down to its current levels where now coho retention is, uh, has been stopped entirely since the mid 1990s without any signs of recovery in the coho stocks. 
Over the same period, survival rates measured by coated wire tag releases of juvenile fish measure in the survival rate over the, of the fish over their first ocean year have declined in parallel with the declining abundance. So the decline in this fishery is not due to lack of juvenile fish entering the ocean. It's due to a decline in the survival rates of those fish to become large enough to be harvested. Uh, when we convert the survival rates to natural mortality rates and plot them against seal abundance, we find that the natural mortality rates uh, increase over the years is very well explained statistically by increases in sea lion seal abundance. And we can calculate what the regression slopes of these regressions should be from how much seals eat and how many juvenile fish are at risk to uh, harvest and they line up quite nicely. The predicted mortality rate increase from diet data is very similar to the mortality rate observed statistically for Chinooks and Coho. So both uh, statistical studies and, uh, and diet studies uh, and consumption rate estimates all agree uh, on the, that the proximate cause of mortality rate increase has been uh, predation mortality by seals in the Georgia Strait. Okay, now uh, let me, as my third case study here, talk about a little bit about <laughs> Fraser River sockeye. Fraser sockeye has uh, been very extensively studied uh, over more than a century. The Fraser River is a complex production system. There's at least three, over 300 recognized areas where fish have spawned, representing probably at least 100 distinct, uh, genetically distinct stocks. These stocks are basically divided up between fish up in the north that spawn early in the year and fish further south that spawn later in the year so that their juveniles end up going into the nursery lakes around the province uh, at about the same time each year, the time when the spring plankton bloom develops. So it's a fascinating ecology uh, topic for another seminar. Uh, when we look at the long-term history of, uh, of the total run size, run size has been estimated back into the 1880s up to the present. So we have about 134 years of estimates based on catch and spawning runs of how large the total Fraser River stock has been. Uh, in the 1800s and early 1900s, the stock had a, had a violent four year cycle of one big year out of every four and then the other three years much lower. Then we had the Hell's Gate disaster that blocked access to spawning areas in the Fraser in 1913 and the stocks were decimated. Then there was a long, slow period of stock rebuilding when actually an interesting point about this rebuilding is that the uh, stocks were technically being overexploited throughout the rebuilding period. They were being exploited at higher rates than would be optimal for producing catches, and yet they managed to recover. And then uh, starting in the, uh, in the 1990s, we started to see a decline again and a return to this spiky pattern with only one big year out of every four. And this has culminated this year in the lowest spawning run since the Hell's Gate disaster, when almost a million sockeye were expected to appear off the Fraser River mouth this fall. And uh, only less than 300,000 fish actually made it. Uh, exploitation rates, were reduced dramatically in response to the observation, beginning observation of the decline. And this severe reduction in exploitation rates has done nothing to reverse the declines. In particular, the low years are getting lower rapidly despite almost complete fishery closures on the Fraser. So you can't argue that the Fraser River sockeye stock has collapsed because of fishing or anything like it. When we uh, do direct estimates of potential sockeye consumption by sea lions based on sea lion abundances along the sockeye migration route where they're returning, 
We now, uh, we calculated predation mortality rates have increased mainly due to stellar sea lion abundance increases to now be higher than the exploitation rates caused by the fishery in, in recent years. There is uh, one uh, sockeye stock for which we have uh, direct measurements of the mortality rate of uh, juveniles from the time they leave the nursery lake, Choco Lake, until they come back as adults. And a warning here that these mortality rates include uh, potentially high mortality rates uh, during the downstream migration of the juveniles as well as mortality occurring in the ocean. So what we find is that for Choco, where we have these so-called marine mortality estimates, uh, the Mortality estimates are quite well correlated with the potential sea lion consumption based on sea lion numbers and uh, uh, and their increase over time. And uh, perhaps more importantly, uh, these mortality rate estimates are apparently, the mortality pattern is apparently depensatory. That is, uh, years of low abundance relative to the abundance of stellar sea lions have experienced much higher marine mortality rates than years when the run sizes were large. That's the same basic pattern that we're seeing uh, in, the, in the Fraser River as a whole. The low runs are going lower, the high runs are staying relatively high. So we're, we're definitely seeing depensatory increase in natural mortality rates. That same depensatory pattern uh, is obvious in the uh, herring data that I showed you also. Herring mortality rates have been much higher in years of low abundance than in years of high abundance, of high herring abundance. Uh, depensatory mortality is a, a major concern, for, particularly for small pelagics like herring and for sockeye salmon and for fish stocks in general. Let me just be clear about what we mean by this. Depensatory mortality is defined as an increase in the proportion of fish that die when the abundance of those fish at risk to harvest is, uh, is low. So we measure the mortality rate as the number that are eaten by the predator divided by the number at risk. So if the number at risk is really large, it doesn't matter if a large number are eaten, the mortality rate will be low. But if the predators keep eating the same numbers, as seals do when they're able to target herring easily on herring spawning aggregations, then when the numbers at risk uh, of fish at risk go down, that percentage mortality rate goes up. And that's called depensatory mortality. Uh, I want to just close, end this quite short seminar. I see I'm taking much less time than I expected by talking about the impact of depensatory mortality on fisheries policy. Uh, our standard models of fisheries say that when a biomass of something like herring increases, the population growth rate should be high when the population is small and the growth rate, relative growth rate, should go down as population size goes up. That is, we should see a compensatory improvement in population growth rate at low abundances, and it's that compensatory improvement that actually creates the, the possibility of sustainable harvesting. Without that improvement, as soon as we start to fish, fish would just decline. But in the presence of depensatory predation, this pattern of compensation, a forgiving pattern for fisheries, changes to one that looks like this picture here where there is a big decline in population growth rate or relative growth rate at a, over a range of intermediate abundances of, of fish. What this can cause is a situation where there is an upper equilibrium and healthy equilibrium abundance in the presence of fishing, but a critical population size below which the stock will collapse down and tend to remain down at a relatively low level and it can remain down at that low level for long periods of time, even if fishing is reduced. So depensation has a profound impact on uh, basically management of over-harvesting risk. 
that says that if your stock size does go down to a lower level, it's not going to recover anywhere near as fast as you would predict when you stop fishing uh, if you ignore the predation effect when you're making your predictions about population recovery. Uh, there's a kind of neat way of looking at this. You can take these pictures of uh, how the equilibrium abundances change with uh, fishing mortality rate. And if you plot them with both fishing mortality rate and predator abundances uh, on two axes, you get a, a surface of population equilibria, a pattern of variation in the population equilibria that's called a cusp catastrophe. So as long as you're operating here at a fishing mortality rate and abundance of marine mammals, uh, if you start at a high abundance of fish, you'll stay up at a high level and things will vary around in a decent way. But if you increase the fishing mortality rate or the marine mammal abundance increases, you fall off the edge of a cliff down to a low equilibrium level, very rapidly collapse. And then even if you reduce fishing mortality rates, you may have to reduce it very low or there may not be any recovery. Or if there is a recovery, the recovery back towards the upper equilibrium point will be drastically slowed by the impact of the marine mammal predation. So uh, having depensatory structures in an ecosystem has profound effects on how we, should how we have to manage those ecosystems. So now uh, to closing, let me, uh, let me talk a little bit uh, about our basic management options for herring and salmon in British Columbia. Uh, salmon that are uh, apparently being impacted by high marine mammal predation rates today, much higher than natural predation rates. First, we can simply adopt radically precautionary harvest policies. We can admit that productivity has gone down. We can assert that we can do nothing about it, despite uh, it being due to predation, and we can harvest what little is left over after the marine mammals take their share. Uh, we could regulate marine mammal abund abundances just like we would any other fishery. We just say, well, these things are eating fish just like fisheries do, so let's cull them and reduce their abundances to make the fisheries more productive. Uh, a third option would be to uh, restore the traditional First Nations harvesting system that kept abundances for, of marine mammals for the last several millennia much lower than they are today. Uh, there's lots of good reasons for trying to restore that First Nations harvesting system uh, because of its benefits to First Nations people. Uh, DFO has uh, implicitly adopted the first strategy of just cutting back harvesting and hoping that things will recovery, recover, and they have largely been blaming stock collapses on factors outside of our control like climate change uh, without even admitting generally the possibility that things like predation could be involved in these collapses. That second strategy would involve culling marine mammals just going out there and killing them off, just like taking away their fishing licenses. That would be an extremely publicly unpopular and unnecessary choice if it's possible to restore harvesting through uh, a First Nations harvesting system. Uh, there are active proposals for restoration of that traditional harvesting system that have been on DFO managers' desks for now two years without any action on their part. So they're clearly uh, de delaying action as long as possible because whatever management choice they make is gonna be hugely unpopular. Just to close here, there have been a DFO and UBC has helped to host a series of workshops on uh, pinniped predation impacts and what needs to be done about them. And the general conclusion from those workshops has been that we need more data, you know, the usual nonsense about more research is needed. More, more data will not tell us anything if it's collected under current conditions of high marine mammal abundances. The only way we're going to find out whether or not the assertions I've made in this talk about marine mammal impacts being large will be to reduce marine mammal abundances and see if the impacts are correspondingly reduced. 
we can collect, we have enough data now to know that it's possible that marine mammals are causing the problem. We don't know whether or not marine mammal impacts are additive or whether they're exaggerated. And the only way we can find that out is if we uh, make a bold experiment. I'm not saying we should make that experiment. I simply want to emphasize to anyone who is involved in fisheries research or management at this point, that the last thing we need is more descriptive research data collected under conditions that can't possibly provide us the right answers. So that, that concludes the talk. Ooh, that took only half an hour. That's the way these, uh, these seminars should be uh, in the quantitative group. So there's plenty of time for questions and discussions. Yeah, thanks very much, Carl. Uh, and yeah, I'd like to open it up for questions. So I thought that was uh, gonna take a whole hour. <laughs> well, I think <laughs> so you get a bunch of questions here. So, um, so uh, yeah, just uh, you want me to Please. continue sharing the screen while you do this so I can see yeah, that? Okay. Yeah, good, yeah. So surely there must be some questions. So uh, please, uh, I think there's a raise hand option. Uh, raise your hand and ask a question, please. Carl, we have a few questions already in the chat box. I don't, I don't see the chat box. Why don't you just ask them to let, let them share the questions verbally. Certainly. Uh, Barry Crow, you uh, had a question? Yeah, um, can you hear, hear me, guys? Yes, I can. Fine. Okay, um, I, I unfortunately have difficulty joining the meeting and I missed most of the talk. But I would like to ask the question, and it's been on my mind for quite some time, um, has anybody looked into um, what the indiscriminate release of rainbow trout into the Fraser watershed is also doing to our salmon populations? Now, I know this is a talk about pinnipods, and I, I could focus on pinnipods. I'm a commercial fisherman myself. I'm well aware of what pinnipods are doing to my nets. And um, where I can fish and where I can't fish, I do a lot of food fishing for the First Nations. And I won't even take a contract to fish um, Chinook salmon. Uh, I, I can answer your question right now in a very simple way. We've been stocking large numbers of rainbow trout into the Fraser River watershed for about 50 years or more. It's been a major tool of freshwater fisheries management and it did not cause problems over most of that time. I think we can pretty well say no, rainbow trout stocking uh, has not changed that much and is not causing the problems. Okay, Thank you. Great. So This is one of the nice things that we, we can, the way I can answer questions like this when we have long-term historical data, we can go right back and look at this long period for which we had low uh, abundances of pinnipeds out there, sea lions and seals, and ask what was the ecosystem like over that period from 1920 till 1980 when these abundances were low. So people have brought up another thing. They've said, well, gee, well, if you reduce these marine mammal abundances, won't the hake populations increase and won't that cause a decline in the salmon because hake eat salmon? They don't actually, but we can look back and say, no, that's a crazy argument. If the hake were going to increase or some other thing was going to come out of the basement because of the lack of marine mammal predation, it would have happened over that 50 year long period of, uh, of low abundance of pinnipeds. We'd have already seen it. Same thing with rainbow trout. Thank you. And uh, we'll continue with Dave Rosen followed by Abraham and Murdoch. I'm oh, sorry, and, uh, and Brett. Uh, thank you, Billy. Thank you, Carl. I really enjoyed your seminar. Um, I know you're not specifically advocating um, for a, a First Nations harvest, but as a, a, let's say, an ecological modeling exercise, have you run the numbers of uh, what level of harvest would be required as far as number of animals uh, taken and over what time period would be required in order to see a significant effect in the fisheries? 
Oh, yeah, yeah. We've run lots of really, David, lots of really detailed calculations on that and put all of them in a huge proposal to the yeah. Pacific Balance Pinniped Society to DFO. It turns out that uh, we've got enough marine mammal data from the decline and recovery periods and the productivity information to be fairly precise about uh, what kind of harvest rates would be needed to reduce the numbers and, and, uh, and what kind of sustainable harvest would be possible under a long-term uh, harvesting system. And uh, I don't believe that anyone would at this point advocate reducing the marine mammal abundances to less than about half of what they are today. In other words, reduce them down to about the level that should produce the uh, largest average uh, marine mammal harvest to the harvesting interests. Uh, with a 50% reduction in marine mammal abundances over several years, uh, you know, the numbers are like harvesting 10,000 a year for four or five years. Uh, <clears throat> that what we calculate would bring back about one third of the historical maximum uh, abundance and fishing uh, of opportunity in the Georgia Strait system. It wouldn't restore it entirely. There would still be fairly high predation rates, but it would be a lot better than the situation today. And the whole suite of uh, small Chinook and Coho stocks that are severe threat of extinction today, the marine survival rates are so low that they're headed towards extinction. It would remove that extinction risk uh, issue with interior Fraser coho and probably steelhead and uh, as well. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Brett, our new SFU colleague is here. Great talk, Carl, as always. Um, uh, my question is kind of along the same lines as David's, um, but in the opposite direction. If we do nothing, where is the carrying capacity for seals and sea lions? And what is our, do you have any idea what the projection is for our, our catches of herring and salmon in the next 10, 20, 30 years? Where, where are we headed if we keep, keep on the uh, same path? Well, uh, sea, uh, seal populations have stabilized along most of the coast. They've been fairly stable since about 1990 <coughs> or a little, or 2000. <laughs> so they're at, they're apparently at carrying capacity. Uh, the stellar sea lion population increased very rapidly until the last census, I think it was 2019 or 2018, and the growth rate has slowed down. So it looks like that population is also stabilizing. We have one problem is that uh, we're seeing apparently increases in the numbers of California sea lions moving into British Columbia seasonally and may even be starting to breed in British Columbia. The California sea lion population, most of it historically bred off California coast. So we are seeing uh, increases in that population. Um, so what the other part of your question? I, you know, man's getting- Oh, I, I, if we're not at carrying capacity, what, what does that mean for catches in the next, in the foreseeable future? Oh, okay. It yeah, sounds well, like it's kind of stabilized. For the, the herring fishery, uh, for some reason, sea lions don't move into the Georgia Strait much during the winter. So as far as we can tell, the single largest herring stock, the Georgia Strait stock, is not at any great risk to collapse <laughs> uh, unless the invasion of California sea lions creates a, a much stronger depensation pattern than we've seen historically, or something else causes a much higher proportion of the stellar sea lion population to move into the strait. The areas that are, are really low now, uh, Haida Gwaii and the west coast of the island, are recovering slowly <coughs> in herring spawning biomass uh, because of the long fishery closures. So we will be seeing opportunities for very restricted uh, herring harvesting in those areas uh, as the biomasses recover and the predation mortality rates go down, the depensatory effects drop off in those stocks. But those, uh, those sustainable harvests are gonna be very low compared to what was taken historically. Uh, for Chinook and Coho, uh, the survival rates are down low enough now around the Georgia Strait region that I don't think we can talk about any, there being much of any uh, sustainable harvest in the near future. 
except from hatchery stocks. Thank you. And Latvin, you had a question? Yes. Uh, thanks, Carl. Um, in a recent perspective that I uh, quickly read recently, uh, you advocated for stellar sea lion diet study. Um, and I'm wondering, like here you're saying, uh, you know, we don't need more descriptive data. Yeah. And I'm curious about what the, uh, what changed your mind on that? Or if anything did? Well, uh, you got me, Steve. <laughs> That's one place where we do need it. The, uh, as you know, the bulk of the steel uh, of the sake come down along the north, hit the coast somewhere near the north end of Vancouver Island. Some come down the west coast of the island, some go into the Johnson Strait. Right out at the tip of Vancouver Island is the Triangle Island area where the largest sea lion rookery in British Columbia is, and there are rookeries down along the west coast. That period of migration for the stocks that have declined most severely through the area where the sea lions are abundant is quite short, 20, 30 days, and the fish are passing. So, and we don't have detailed diet composition data on what sea lions are eating during, and the ones who are hanging around those rookeries specifically during that period. It's possible that uh, detailed diet studies would allow us to say, no, this can't be sea lions that are causing the problem, that there just aren't enough of them or the fish aren't exposed to them for long enough or they aren't eating enough of them. Uh, so yeah, you got me. I should have said that's one place where uh, where some detailed diet composition data might make a difference. But in the herring cases and the Georgia Strait, uh, Chinook and Coho cases, more data is, won't help at all. Thank you. But you were talking, Carl, about seal and the, and the seal workshop, so that's a different question. Um, Pat Allen? Yeah, thank you. Um, really what I'm interested in is what is the relative role or risk um, uh, comparatively for uh, out migrant smolt predation versus adult predation of returning adults and is that driven by mostly by sea, li sea lions, stellar sea lions, or is it driven by uh, harbor seals or a combination? Okay, if you're looking at, at say sockeye, the sockeye migrate rapidly out to the Georgia Strait where they would be exposed to seal predation. We don't think seals have, t have time to eat a lot of them, nor do they apparently target them. So sockeye, the main issue is about targeted predation on sockeye aggregations during the returning adult migration in the ocean. Uh, they also target them uh, at the river mouth and as they're migrating up the Fraser, but uh, don't think that that's taking place for a long enough period of time for a really high mortality to occur. Uh, with Chinook and Coho, uh, there is a little bit of targeted predation at stream mouths as the juveniles are migrating downstream. Uh, seals aggregated in my stream mouth, particularly to target hatchery Chinook and coho salmon that are dumber than fence and steelhead that are dumber than fence posts on their way downstream. Uh, but the fish very quickly spread out into the ocean, uh, a move dispersed fairly widely. And uh, most the diet composition data tells us that most of the cumulative uh, seal mortality on ch Chinook and coho is occurring on the juveniles over about a six month period after they spread away from the river mouths. Uh, there certainly is predation on the adults when they come back, there always has been. Uh, the estimates, it's sort of typical estimates are that uh, predators will nail about 20 to 40% of the Chinook and Coho adults while they're uh, holding uh, off river mouths waiting for suitable uh, flow conditions to enter smaller streams. So there's a potential for large impact, uh, particularly in very dry years when there's delayed uh, uh, spawn migration timing by coho salmon. And then uh, when we estimate the uh, first, what we call the first year ocean mortality rate of Chinook salmon, 
it's not actually the first year ocean mortality rate that we're measuring. It's uh, a mortality rate based on back calculating how many age two, how many fish in the ocean reached age two. So we can calculate mortality from ocean entry to age two. But it's back calculated assuming constant natural mortality rates. Well, if marine mammal predation on age two, three, and four Chinooks has been increasing over time, we won't see that directly in the data. It will back calculate it as having occurred on fish during their first ocean year. Now, Peter Elisiak has brought up this point and said that it may be that what we're calling first year ocean mortality, uh, predation mortality uh, on Chinook salmon actually represents mortality on Chinook salmon occurring throughout their ocean life cycle. There's significant Chinook salmon diet proportions in seals and sea lions all on the coast throughout the year. Long answers. Thank you. Uh, Hal Yoke, you had a question? No more Hi questions? There, no, we have a few more questions. Uh, Hal York. Do you want to answer your question, ask your question? Uh, he seems to be on the phone. Carl, the question is, what would the seal, sea lion population reduction do to the predators of seal, sea lions, such as transient killer whales? Uh, we've looked into that. Uh, when you look at superficially at the transient killer whale data, uh, about half of the prey that they eat are, uh, are uh, uh, seals. They particularly like to eat baby seals. Uh, the, uh, but the thing is that that, that represents only about 20% of the weight of their diet because the much smaller numbers of larger prey that they take, like sea lions and some of the porpoises and so on, actually end up making up a, a large proportion of their diet. So we've run a series of calculations on this, and yes, it is possible that there will be a reduction in transient sea lion abundance off the BC coast uh, if there's a reduction in seals and sea lion abundances. But what that will actually represent is that the transients will just move somewhere else where there's more abundant prey. They'll go chase California sea lions or whatever. It will not mean any increased threat to the, uh, to the transient sea lion population of the coast, which is a bunch of animals that move very widely uh, all along the Pacific coast. Michael and Tom. Oh, hi, sorry. Um, I missed a large part of the presentation. I'm very sorry. Well, screw Carl, you, I, brothers. You don't get to ask a question. Okay, fine. Screw you then. Uh, no, uh, the question was that this decision has been navigated in other parts of the world. Canada's had calls. Um, someone in government's making a decision between marine mammal life versus terrestrial mammal livelihood. That's us. I mean, who's the person who makes that decision? How was it made in other places? Um, and doesn't it need a more complete, or maybe it doesn't, economic analysis of what the impacts on the humans are? Because maybe the case is not being made on that side uh, in a way that's ma make it very, very crystal clear what the hard if, decision yeah, is. Yeah, if it were a pure economic case, if we put the, just the numbers down for economic benefits of commercial and sport fishing, what we estimate those to be in the jobs that they generate and so on like that, there wouldn't even be an issue at all. We would call marine and har we would harvest marine mammals extensively in order to increase the value of the fisheries. I think even if, yeah, even I, if there's a fairly high risk that that experiment would fail, the experiment has a very high expected uh, economic benefit to cost ratio. Is the, is the uh, issue here that- but, uh, the, the issue is that there's a very large community of people who are opposed to marine mammal harvesting for ethical okay. reasons. Okay, fine. And but they let's represent um, actually probably a majority of the Canadian public. Okay, but let's 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 propose a, a scenario where it was terrestrial mammals, let's say bears, 
or something similar that required salmon that were dying out, would this decision be made easier? Is it just because it, the, on one end of the trade offs, it's human beings? Is that the problem? No, here? no, we actually have something close to that, even closer than that. Uh, the southern resident killer whales apparently depend heavily on Chinook salmon. So the evidence I've presented here and has been developed by other people suggests that the main reason that there's a lack of food for uh, the southern resident killer, endangered southern resident killer whales is because the seals and, seals and sea lions are getting their Chinook salmon, not the fisheries. And I think that's evidenced by how the fisheries have been drastically reduced and it hasn't done any good. So we have a case even closer to home where we have two conflicting uh, conservation interests. Uh, this isn't the first time. The first time I ran into this was actually out in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands where there was evidence that uh, monk seals uh, populations increases were causing uh, uh, declines in, uh, in, in mock lobster fisheries. Then uh, they started to see monk seal declines and those are associated with uh, increases in uh, shark abundances. Sharks targeting the monk seals. So there you got two endangered species. How are you gonna save the monk seals without, deal, without causing trouble with the, uh, the shark protection programs? So some of these, some of these conservation species based things, basically there is no good answer. There's serious trade-offs. The trade-offs need much more honest and clear public debate and discourse. And in our case, there's a serious, in salmon particular, there's a serious need to look very closely at First Nations rights in this whole business and First Nations opportunities, which may be the trump card in finally deciding whether or not we restore the, the marine mammal harvesting system that they had for thousands of years. Rob Bison had a question. Rob, do you still want to ask a question? Uh, <clears throat> I was curious in what, how Carl might respond to what, how should we potentially be thinking about uh, production hatcheries for salmon uh, going forward if, if in fact the predation uh, hypothesis proves to be correct? What should we be doing with our production hatcheries? Uh, continue, morning, Rob. Uh, continuing to grow. Oh, yeah. Let me, before I answer Rob's question, let me apologize to Rob Bison and Josh Corman, who've been doing some really good work recently on looking at the possible role of uh, marine mammal predation and causing the severe declines in uh, steelhead populations on the Fraser River that we've seen over the same period of time that Chinook and Coho declines have occurred. I didn't want to talk about their thing. They got to give their own seminar, eh, you guys. But, but, but anyhow, Rob, um, oh, what I did, I lost track of what I would. The, 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 um, the, the, um, the, role, the role that production hatcheries might be. Oh, okay, right. No, I, in, I'd say basically the uh, uh, these production hatcheries generate a net benefit in, in to the fisheries or did when their survival rates were high. They generated in particular localized fishing opportunities that wouldn't have been there at all, like the huge sport fishery off the mouth of the Capilano River and some limited commercial fishing opportunities as well. Back in the old days, we used to think that they represented a direct threat to wild stocks through competition in early ocean life. But now we've seen with more data that uh, declining hatchery releases which have occurred have not resulted in improved survival rates of the wild stock. So I think we can reject the idea that there's a direct negative effect of having hatcheries on wild stocks. We also used to worry about how in unregulated fisheries, when you dump a whole bunch of hatchery fish out into the places like the Georgia Strait, that will attract higher fishing pressure. The hooks out there in the water will then generate higher mortality rates on wild stocks. And that could result in overfishing of the wild stocks. Uh, something like occurred with uh, with sockeye salmon in the Skeena River, where building the spawning channels on the Skeena generated sockeye stocks that were could withstand harvest rates a lot higher than the, some of the wild Skeena River sockeye stocks can withstand. 
and pursuing those high exploitation rates did cause some declines in the less productive wild stocks. So it's a, the answer to your question is complex in a way, but in terms of Chinook and coal, I say keep producing them, love them. If we can get them to survive, then they're gonna generate a huge, far more benefits than they, uh, than they are today. Even if they're just fodder for the, for the mammals? Well, no, I mean, you leave the mammals out there, that's exactly what they are as fodder. I mean, right now, the returns to the fisheries from those hatcheries are trivially small. You can't justify, economically justify and continuing hatchery operations uh, with the kind of returns they're getting. It's kind of like that one up in your area where they, Ray Hilborn calculated that the Chinook salmon returned to, what was it, which the Dead Man Creek? Chinook was each dead man Chinook in the fishery was costing five hundred dollars or something like that to produce. Thank you, Carl. Rob. We have we have five minutes left, and uh, I think we should try to get the question from Abraham and Joy in as well. So two more questions. Abraham. Yes. Hi. Um. This is Christine Abraham. Thanks very much for. Oh. Your hey. talk, Carl. Um, so I have a question regarding other upper trophic level predators. Um, we've had two relatively comprehensive workshops between the US and Canada to date presenting all of the, the data regarding pinniped diets and their impacts on Chinook. And to date, there is little scientific agreement that pinnipeds are indeed having an impact. I'm wondering if you can tell me given that there are so many other, there are dozens and dozens of other upper trophic level predators, important predators of salmon in the region. I mean, there are a million uh, short beak common dolphins in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what other predator diets have been evaluated, including small cetaceans and other predatory fish? None that I know about, nor do we have a good abundance in trend information for those others. You know, we've been focusing on, on seals and sea lions basically because we do have the abundance information and the diet information we have uh, indicates that they are capable of causing the mortality rate increases. We don't yeah, have I... comparable trend or diet information for others. Uh, you know, anecdotally, uh, there certainly have been increases in dolphin populations and so on in recent years. But anecdotally, those increases began well after the severe declines in survival rates that we started to see in the 1980s and 1990s. So there's an I issue guess, of timing. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I, I would caution the interpretation of one small population of marine mammals having a significant range-wide impact on Chinook salmon given that there are the the biomass of alternate predators of salmon out there is well, hold on is way we're, more we're not right. talking about a small biomass we're talking about a large biomass of predators by predator standards well but not relatively not, not compared food, to small cetaceans not animals with high cetaceans. food consumption rates and with known inclusion of the species of salmon that we're worried about in their diets at levels sufficient to explain the declines. But I guess that's my point. Different story. You only evaluate the diet of seals and sea lions and you don't have the diet composition of the millions no. and millions of small cetaceans. No, no. And, that and we know there. that in fact of, of the total mortality rates that these fish suffer, the uh, marine mammals are only causing apparently about 30% of that mortality rate. It's not the total mortality rate and all that are being eaten that matters. It's the change in mortality rate that's occurred. And this is the only change in mortality agents that we can document as having occurred coincident in time with the increases in mortality rate. You know, mo most fish die out there, most Chinook and Coho die. The story is more complex with Chinook because of the large, inter uh, large variation among stocks in apparent responses, the much noisier survival patterns, they're not as clear cut as per coho. And because uh, there are highly variable proportions of time that different stocks are spending outside the area where we calculate the predation mortality rates to be high outside of the Georgia Strait during parts of their ocean rearing. So uh, it is more of a gamble 
to hope that Chinook stocks are going to recover than it is uh, for coho stocks to recover. The coho stock recovery is a much more likely thing. Thank you. And uh, Murdoch, do you want to uh, round this off? I'm afraid we have to close it down now. It's 10 30. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd like to give the uh, opportunity to Joy Thorkelson to ask a question if she's still there. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. My question is just um, is very quick. It, it's what uh, if there's been any studies in Alaska now um, uh, on seals and sea lion predation as their stocks are, are have also started to fail in the last couple of years. Uh, hi, Joy. Uh, no, the, uh, there, there are uh, visual surveys up, up through your area and on up into Alaska of seal, seal and sea lion abundances. I don't think any of those show a really dramatic increase and the densities of seals and sea lions are much lower per unit coastline length up there than they are in southern British Columbia, much lower in your area than they are in southern British Columbia. Uh, in your area there, uh, there have been these recent declines in, uh, in sockeye returns uh, in more and more years. Uh, so those fish are migrating in past the tip of what is it, uh, Noise Island, and there, there's a very large stellar sea lion rookery. Is it Noise Island? Yeah. What's the one on Forrester. the north? Forester Island. Yeah. Uh, and it's possible that uh, that those uh, sea lions are are targeting uh, Skinner River sockeye as uh, now. I haven't looked at the data. Uh, I don't think there's any diet composition information from up there that would support an argument one way or the other. Sorry, I, I couldn't be more specific about it. But no, I'm not aware of any uh, any evidence of a, of a progressive decline in Alaskan Chinook or Coho productivity, uh, anything like what we're seeing in Southern British Columbia. No, okay. thanks. I, the American fishermen were just getting concerned uh, when we've been speaking with them at the panel about their increases in seals and sea lions. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, there you go. Maybe it's happening there as well. It'd be a fisherman would be the first one to see it, of course. As you well know, they see things before the biologists usually. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Carl, for your really interesting presentation. Thanks, everybody, for participating. Uh, and uh, there will be uh, Carl's slides available for anybody who would like to have a copy. Um, and uh, this presentation has been recorded, so that will be also available for anybody who wishes to, to get a copy of that. And that will be made available probably sometime later today. Uh, so thanks again, um, and I'll uh, keep you posted about uh, upcoming talks. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Carl.